What is going on guys welcome back to the algorithms and data structures tutorial series in today's episode we're going to talk about insertion sort and insertion sort is the last algorithm that we're going to consider inefficient here when it comes to sorting after that we're going to look at the divide and conquer algorithms merge sort and quick sort but today we're going to look at insertion sort so let us get right into it so let us start again with the intuition behind the insertion sort as the name already suggests we're going to insert numbers or elements where they belong instead of just swapping all the time. So what we're doing here when it comes to insertion sort is let's say we have a list like seven, uh, six or not six, seven, four, eight, three, two, one, five. Did I miss something? Six. There you go. Uh, this is the list that we have here. And now instead of uh, going through it and swapping elements or comparing them, what we do is we split this list up imaginary um, in, in our head, we split it up into two parts in the sorted part and the not sorted part. And in the beginning, the sorted part is just one number, the first element, um, this seven here. And now what we do is we go through this list and we pick the next element and insert it into the sorted list. So we take this four here, and then we insert it into the sorted section where it belongs. Now four is less than seven, so we insert it before the seven. And the, uh, and the sorted part looks like this then. So we have four, seven, and then we still have eight, three, two, one, five, six, and so on. But that is now the sorted part of the list. So this is now the sorted part. Then we'll look at the next element, eight, and insert it into the list. In this case, it would be four, seven, eight. So we write that down, four, seven, eight. And we have three, two, one, five, six, and the sorted section is um, this here again. Now we get to three, we're going to enter three here. Then we get to two, two is here. Then we get to one, one is here. Then we get to five, five belongs here. And then we get to six, six belongs here. So this is what we do. We take the list and we put a flag at a certain index where we say, okay, this is the barrier. This is on the left side, we have the sorted list on the right side, we have the unsorted list. And then in the beginning, the sorted list is just one element, because obviously one element is always going to be sorted. And then we pick the next element and insert it into the right position, the next element insert it into the right position, and so on until we get a sorted list. So now let's go ahead and look at the pseudocode to see what's going on here. We have the insertion sort function definition here, we pass a list, let's go ahead with the list four, uh, six, five, three, one, two, something like that. Um, and now what we're doing is we're having this list here, passing the system to function, and we have the first loop here, which runs from one to n to size of list. Uh, we're starting at one because we already said we have this boundary here, this magic boundary, which, uh, which says this is the sorted side, this is the unsorted side. So we're not going to look at the element zero, we're going to look at the element one, two, three, four, five. Um, so we're starting from index one. And then we're saying, okay, the value that we're going to look at the variable value uh, is essentially just the element at index i that we're currently at. So in this case, six, and then we have uh, a counter, so to say, which uh, starts at the current index, which is one, and it counts down. So what we do here is we say we have a we have a second loop here, a while loop, not a full loop anymore. Uh, and we say while j is a positive number, because this is important, because we decrease j here, uh, we, we decrease it by one with each iteration. So as long as it's still larger than zero, and as long as the element at the index j minus one is larger than the value, uh, we're going to shift the values so that new values fit in, so to say. So what we do in this case is we, we say, okay, j is still larger than zero, because it's one, and list j minus one, which is this year, um, four is not larger, um, larger than uh, than the value. So what we do is we essentially just say, six is already in the place where it should be, because if it wasn't, we would have to uh, swap the positions essentially, but six is larger than four. So we just leave it there. And the only thing that we do is we shift the boundary. Uh, let me just find the yellow color again. There you go. This is the new boundary here. Now we go to the next thing. So we increase i by one, and we now have five as the value here. So five is the value that we're currently looking at. Let's just pick the blue color again. Five is the value that we're looking at. The index is two. And now we say, okay, while j is larger than zero, it is. And list j minus one is larger than the value. 
and it is in this case because six is larger than five, what do we do then? We look at the list J, which is five itself, um, and we say that this is just six. So we swap this position. We, we just delete this here and we say, okay, it's J minus one. So we have two sixes right here, but we have the value five still saved in the variable value. So what we do next is we decrease J by one. Uh, so J is only one. And then what we do is we say, okay, uh, J is still larger than zero, but in this case, um, J minus one is not larger than value. So four is not larger than uh, five. So we just leave it and we say, okay, list J equals value. So at this position, we enter five. This is how it essentially works. We just look um, for free, uh, not for free spaces, but we start counting down from the actual position and we look for larger numbers. As long as there are larger numbers, we're going one position back. Um, and in the end, we just put the position, uh, put the value that we're looking uh, to insert into that position. And if we don't find any larger values at all, we're going to put it at index zero. So this is how it essentially works. And we're going to end up with the sort of list, which is one, two, three, four, five, obviously. So this is what the pseudocode does. So let us now as always go ahead and analyze the runtime complexity of this pseudocode of this algorithm here. Uh, let's start by pointing out the primitive operations here we have two primitive operations here we have one primitive operation. Uh, and here we have two more primitive operations, you can see that these uh, primitive operations here these two and this one here are together because they're directly in the full loop and this full loop if you look at it, it runs from one to n. Uh, if it would run from zero to n, it would be n times. So now it runs from one to n, which is n minus one times. So uh, essentially, what you can say is you have three operations that are definitely going to run n minus one times. So you say three times n minus one, this is definitely true. And then you have this loop here or this block here. And um, this block also runs n minus one times because of this loop. But how many times uh, does this code run here? So how many times uh, does this loop iterate? And since we're looking at the worst case complexity, we're going to look at the worst case scenario, uh, which is, you know, you start with j equals i, uh, and you're decreasing j by one with each iteration, if the condition is met. Now, in the worst case scenario, we're going to assume that it's always met. So what we do is we essentially just uh, decrease j by one until we get to zero, because we just ignored this one here. Uh, since it's the worst case scenario, j is the same thing as i. So this thing runs i times. So what we can say is three times n minus one plus and we have two primitive operations in here plus two times and we're starting i equals zero or actually i equals one, which is the same thing. Because um, if you have, uh, I'm going to tell you in a second why uh, up until n minus one, because obviously we're running n minus one times. Um, you can start from zero or from 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 one because it doesn't matter because what we're going to sum up here is the i value. So if you have zero, it's just nothing and you can ignore the zero or add the zero, it doesn't matter. Um, so this is what we're going to look at two times the sum from i equals one to n minus one from i or off i. And we can put this into Wolfram alpha again, we're going to say uh, sum i, i equals one to n minus one. So this is what we're going to look at. And I'm going to show you as you can see, it's one half times n minus one times n. And if I change this to zero, it will be the same formula. As you can see, nothing changes. So this is the same thing as three times n minus one plus two times. So it cancels out because we have two times one half. And so we can ignore this, we can just uh, forget about the two here. And we have n minus one times n. Now we're going to multiply all of this out. So we have three n minus three, plus n squared minus n. So we have two n, or actually, let's write it down like that we have n squared plus two n minus three, which essentially means that we have a worst case runtime complexity that is in big O of n squared. So again, quadratic. As you can see, this is the runtime complexity of insertion sort. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting the like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. Also, make sure you're subscribed to this channel to see more future videos for free. 
Uh, this video was actually the last one where we're going to talk about these inefficient sorting algorithms like insertion sort, selection sort, bubble sort. In the next videos, we're going to talk about these uh, divide and conquer algorithms like quick sort, merge sort that are way more efficient and have a runtime complexity that is pseudo linear, so n log n. At least in the average case, uh, quick sort has uh, some extra scenarios, some special scenarios uh, where it doesn't have pseudo linear time, but we're going to talk about that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.